The overarching argument of the book is really twofold. Literary criticism, going back to what Socrates called the ancient war between poetry and philosophy, has very often aligned itself with power, the moral standards of the state. In this sense, Emperor Augustus and his favorite poet Virgil played this role perfectly, and allegorical readings of the Song of Songs also play this role very well. These are readings of poetry which reflect the interests of power, readings of poetry that serve the interests of powerful institutions and the needs of those powerful people in institutions to keep a populace in line, in the way that an Ovid, for example, always refused to stay in line, and in the way that the text of the Song of Songs constantly is threatening to burst out of line. The form of criticism that springs out of this, the form that we still see right now, the hermeneutics of suspicion, has some of its roots in responses to that authoritative imposition on poetry. The earliest allegorical readings of Homer, for example, Anaxagoras finding the warp and wolf of rhetoric in Penelope's shroud, the shroud that she's weaving at the end of the Odyssey, were ways of trying to defend against the accusations of people like Xenophanes of Colophon, who argued that Homer and Hesiod had put all that is blame and shame for men into their portraits of the gods. This is a form of criticism that goes back to the 6th century BCE, and is thus pre-Platonic, pre-Socratic criticism. This ancient pattern in criticism warps and changes in the Gregorian period in the West. Scholars like Charles Homer Haskins and others who follow in his wake refer to a 12th century Renaissance. The Renaissance in Europe might have started earlier than we usually give it credit for, only that it is crushed utterly by the 13th century church and its Frankish military arm, beginning with the Albigensian Crusade and continuing through the Inquisition. The twin developments here are the poetry and lifestyle of the troubadour poets, Guilhem of Patois, Bernard de Ventadorn, Beatrice de Dia, among others, and the heretical theological movement, the Cathars. Their really only common elements were in the insistence on believing and living as they saw fit, as opposed to following the dictates of what everyone in the Les Midi region regarded as the foreign Frankish kingdom. If you travel around chateauneuf du pape and areas like that, you will still find people who have these resentments, going back 800 years now. They still do not really regard themselves as French, and they still really regard Paris as a foreign capital, and French as a foreign language imposed on them. You also see the way this changes poetry after the Albigensian Crusade the way it changes poetry with the early Italian poets, the Dolce Stil Novo school, where love is still spoken of, but it is now spoken of, quote, correctly, unquote, according to the dictates of the clerical institution, the church, which is also at the roots of our modern university. Bologna and Paris were the first two Western universities, Bologna having its roots in Frederick I's court, and Paris having its roots in the church-controlled parish and cathedral schools of Paris. It has seemed to me for a long time that there is a tie between these things. The history of poetry is one of its confrontational relationships with philosophy and politics. It's being confronted by philosophy. It's being confronted by political authority. And the specifically erotic poetry in the West, and the way it is turned toward religious and theological purposes, is crucial in understanding this history. The imagery of the troubadours, the imagery of a Giacomo de Lentini, the inventor of the sonnet, are largely identical except for the end goals of them. The troubadours focus on life here on earth, and the early Italian poets, you see this especially in later developments in Dante and Petrarch, redirect that love toward the heavens. There's a sense in which political authority, church authority, often the same thing, really was quite oppressive towards poetry, and the human emotions and desires it describes, and that the fundamental mechanics of that are still at work in this hermeneutics of suspicion style, this critique style of criticism. Bruno Latour was talking about this in 2004. Rita Felsky publishes the book The Limits of Critique in 2016, and now we have published Love and Its Critics in 2017, basically working in this same direction. This form of critical, frankly I would say domination of poetry, has its roots in some really quite disturbing elements in history, and ultimately it has its roots in the idea that the authoritative teachers, the first academics, would have banished poetry altogether. I don't think that we academics are necessarily poetry's friends. I think we've largely been its enemies. Except with friends like us, I don't think you need enemies.